Support for the legislature today is provided by the following. The West Virginia Higher Education Policy Commission, working with students and families to improve college access and student success for a better West Virginia. West Virginia University, online at wvu.edu. Good evening, I'm Andrea Lanham and this is the Legislature Today from the Capitol Building in Charleston. Tonight, the arguments for and against legislation that would change work requirements for West Virginians receiving federal food assistance known as SNAP benefits. That and other floor activity in both the House and Senate chambers later in the program. But first, with the looming statewide teacher work stoppage scheduled later this week, there are several related issues before the Finance and Education Committees. So we're very happy to welcome Delegate Paul Espinoza, Chair of the House Education Committee and member of the House Finance Committee, and Delegate Larry Rowe, member of both the House Education and finance committees. Gentlemen, thank you both for joining us tonight. Thank you for Good having to be us. with you. So before we get into some of the education and finance issues, let's first address the teacher statewide walkout, which is scheduled for this Thursday and Friday over low salaries and the rising cost of their PEIA insurance. Delegate Espinosa, I'll start with you and your thoughts about this. Well, certainly recognize the concerns of our teachers, our school service personnel, and our state uh, workers, but uh, Quite simply, I, I don't believe that our school should be closed on Thursday and Friday. Again, while certainly there are uh, serious issues that uh, need and are being addressed, I think to close our schools and to have our schools not uh, open for, for uh, education on Thursday and Friday, I think is, uh, is a step that frankly is not needed. If you look at uh, the action that the House has taken, and I think also the, that the Senate has and is likely uh, will be taking here, uh, you know, we have uh, taken some serious steps in order to address the concerns. Uh, the House, of course, passed what, uh, if, if ultimately approved, would likely be uh, the largest uh, teacher pay raise in a decade. Uh, and with regard to uh, PIA, which certainly is a significant issue that all of us are hearing quite a bit about, uh, my colleague, uh, Delegate Rowe, and I, uh, as, as members of the House Finance Committee, we've enacted several pieces of legislation here in re recent weeks to uh, pro uh, begin to provide uh, a dedicated long-term source of funding for PIA. We, we enacted legislation this week that would dedicate a portion of any surpluses in our budget to PIA. Uh, the co-tenancy bill, which passed the House, uh, also contains a bipartisan amendment that would dedicate a portion of natural gas royalties to PIA. And then, of course, over in the Senate, as part of the sports uh, betting bill, uh, there was an amendment, a bipartisan amendment, that was uh, uh, adopted that would dedicate a portion of uh, sports uh, betting uh, profits to uh, PIA. So, again, I think uh, both the House and the Senate uh, have taken very serious action on, on um, legislation to address these issues. You know, in light of that action, I just don't see the benefit to our students in, in uh, having schools closed Thursday and Friday. And we're gonna talk about a few of those measures that you mentioned sure. with PEIA and all of those issues later. But first, I wanna get Delegate Rowe, I wanna get your response to that as well. Well, I, you know, I feel like I need to apologize as a member of the legislature to uh, school service personnel, teachers, and public employees because of our failure for so many years to, to provide adequate wages and also for a system that would help pay for health care costs. And what we're doing right now is adding many small band-aids to a very large problem. And, uh, you know, and it's always the last dollar, and we are always having wages and PEIA benefits compete for other programs in general revenue, which is the main funding that we have. And what we need to do, and why I think that we're seeing the, the stoppages, despite some promises of very small raises, it, the reason for that is that, that these folks want some sort of stable, continuing revenue stream dedicated to pay PEIA to make it affordable, keep it affordable, and also to pay raises on a regular basis. You know, our teachers in, in the Eastern Panhandle uh, are, are making less than, uh, they're making $10,000 or uh, less than, they, than the folks in Virginia. So it's easy for them to go out. We've got 700 vacancies because we're not paying. We're trying to come up with ways to have alternative certificates so people can be in the classroom that aren't qualified as teachers. 
you know, all those measures would not be necessary if we paid, you know, good wages both to teachers and also uh, school service personnel. Uh, you know, the raise for school service personnel is only $220 a year. That's $18 a month. The, we were sort of uh, talking on the House side that we, we'll double the Senate's per portion. That's only $36 a month. And the PEIA premiums this year went up $79 a month. So we're not helping people until we can take care of, met, of PEIA and we have to have a stable, predictable, uh, dedicated revenue stream for that. You know, could, should it be a tax on natural gas because that's all going to be leaving the state soon? Should it be just dedicated to particular areas of general revenue? You know, as long as it would be a dedicated revenue stream to assure a fix to PEIA, I think that we wouldn't have the strikes on Thursday and, and Friday. And I'm sorry that, that I think folks feel compelled to do that. They're professionals, they, they take care of our children and do a good job, but I think they feel compelled to get the legislator, legislature to respond. And you had mentioned these dedicated revenue streams and Delegate Espinosa, you mentioned some of the, the bills that had passed so far. Uh, yesterday a bill originating in the House Finance would dedicate 20% of the state's general revenue fund, surplus money into the PEIA stability fund. And like you mentioned, there's been some other amendments tacked onto the co-tenancy bill and another sports betting measure in the Senate as well. That's right. What other dedicated revenue streams can we look at for PEIA that would provide more stability? Well, I think we are taking a varied approach. I think, uh, you know, certainly looking at new revenue streams, uh, obviously, uh, you know, I think we anticipate that you know, they're, they're, you know, with the, the right structure that we can see increases in our natural gas uh, uh, development and uh, certainly co-tenancy is one measure that uh, certainly should do that and I was certainly pleased to support the bill with that uh, amendment in it that again would dedicate a portion of uh, natural gas royalties uh, to PIA. Uh, I think the um, the sports wagering bill. I think certainly that has the potential of uh, of generating a significant uh, por uh, number of dollars for PIA. Uh, you know, there's you know, it's difficult to say just depending on what happens in other states with sports wagering. But I think West Virginia is is poised to be able to take advantage of. Uh, of a positive court ruling by the by the United States Supreme Court that, that could potentially allow sports wagering in West Virginia, and I think uh, you know again having um, uh, the really the first twenty percent of any surpluses each year. If you look at the history of surpluses, uh, I think that's something that perhaps uh, is not well known. But virtually every year we do have a surplus. It varies for anywhere. This last year we had a surplus of I believe uh, in the neighborhood of seventy eight million dollars. Again, twenty percent of that would automatically go into this PIA stabilization fund. Uh, it, uh, that fund would be capped at 75 million, which seems to be a good figure in order to, again, help to stabilize uh, PIA and help to ensure that PIA remains affordable uh, for our, our, our state employees. Another piece of legislation that I, that I didn't mention earlier, but uh, Delegate Rowe and I uh, certainly supported, uh, and I believe it was unanimous, a measure that would uh, immediately take $29 million out of the rainy day account in order to essentially freeze PIA for the coming year. I think it's, it's evident based on our daily discussions with uh, the representatives of the teachers associations and the school service personnel and other employees that there really hasn't been a consensus as to how we truly fix PIA and I think uh, by essentially freezing uh, the uh, PIA plan for this year so that uh, state employees do not see increases or plan changes allowing a task force comprised of all the various stakeholders including representatives of our teachers association school service personnel I think that'll provide an opportunity for for us to hopefully come to a consensus as how we truly fix PIA and um, again keep it affordable for our state employees. Delegate Rowe, do you think that this is going to be enough to avert the, the work stoppage no, on Thursday because, No, because loud and clear what they're hearing is that the legislature refuses to dedicate a stable, sufficient amount of money to assure that there are salary increases this year and, and in following years and also that we will fix PEIA. But, you know, it's, it's always last dollar and it's always in competition with other programs and general revenue. That's the problem. That's why teachers haven't been paid a, a raise in so many years and public employees haven't gotten raised in even longer than that. You know, and, and offering, you know, 18 to $36 an, an hour, I, I'm sorry, a month 
you know, isn't, isn't going to fix anything. And by pulling in revenues from two or three different places, it's not going to come up with what we need. The pay raises are going to require something like $110 million. The uh, PEIA will be something like $60 million because each year we need an extra $50 million. It's a $1 billion program and it increases 5 to 7 percent a year. So you've got to come up with something like 50 million to 60 million every single year in addition to where you were the year before. And so to have the last dollars that we have at the end of a, of a budget year used to, to, to pay part of that, like let's say that there's 20 million available, that'll be gone quickly and it won't even be half of the, of the year increase. So those, the premiums and the benefits will, will be changing as we, as we go forward. And I think that's why folks are willing to, to leave their jobs for a day or two and not to shut down the schools particularly they're going to be playing sports programs and that sort of thing but they've got to get our attention and I, I hope that this will give us an attention uh, uh, event so that we can set the right priorities. So we want to switch gears quickly. Uh, last week, the House Education Committee passed the Campus Self-Defense Act. This bill would strip higher education institutions of the authority to restrict or regulate the carrying of a concealed weapon by a person who holds a current license. Delegate Rowe, you spoke passionately against this bill. Oh, it's a terrible bill. I mean, I, I call it the dormitory gun bill. You know, the, the university has to place something like 5,000 students, uh, incoming freshmen, in dormitories, and they would have to sort out the ones who uh, agreed to have a roommate with a gun and those who don't. What is the, you know, is the gun going to be used whenever, the, you know, what are they going to do with the gun? Is it going to be locked away? What are the rules and regulations? All of the presidents, all of the university campuses are completely opposed to this. Uh, it's, it's radical. It's, it's an impossible administrative burden. Um, I, you know, and, and, and with the, the problems that we have, uh, you know, the, in terms of priorities, it's really something that we're considering a, a dormitory gun bill when we ought to be looking at PEIA and, and pay increases. Delegate Espinosa, I want to quickly get your reaction on that too, of why this, why this bill is necessary. Well, uh, first let me say that there are 10 states who currently do allow campus carry, and I think it's a, um, uh, simply a case of trying to balancing competing rights. Uh, you know, certainly uh, uh, am passionate about education, and but also certainly uh, recognize that uh, all individuals, uh, you know, and including those who hold a, a concealed uh, handgun license, uh, who are subject to background checks and, and training, uh, certainly uh, believe that they should have the ability to uh, use for or carry for self-defense purposes, you know, handguns uh, in areas including college campuses. Now, uh, again, I mentioned that 10 other states currently allow for this. Uh, I do know that there have been uh, extensive discussions between representatives of our high, uh, higher education institutions as well as advocates for the legislation, including the NRA. Um, uh, it's my understanding that based on some of the discussions, uh, while I think there are, there are likely to be some uh, acceptable amendments that are going to be offered and would ultimately be adopted. It's my understanding that that legislation likely will be deferred until at least next year to allow some of those discussions, uh, which I think have been productive, uh, to uh, proceed and be able to, again, come up with a piece of legislation uh, that, you know, while perhaps the higher education institutions won't support, that I think will include some reasonable uh, exclusions, uh, restrictions uh, that advocates for the legislation can, can also accept. That'll be, have to be the last word. We're out of time. Thank you both again for joining us. Thank again, you. we have the Education Chair Delegate Paul Espinoza and Delegate Larry Rowe. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be with you. Thank you very much. Next, the West Virginia House of Delegates has passed a bill that would expand a work requirement to some able-bodied adults without dependents who receive federal food assistance. Senior reporter Dave Missich brings us this report. 4001 would create a workforce requirement for some who receive food benefits through the Federal Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, also known as SNAP. According to federal data, West Virginia has made use of half a billion dollars in SNAP benefits in fiscal year 2015, which went to a monthly average of just under 370,000 residents. Under the bill, able-bodied adults without dependents between the ages of 18 and 49 receiving SNAP benefits would be required to document 20 hours per week of work, workforce training, or volunteerism. Delegate Chad Lovejoy argued against the measure and spoke about his involvement at the Huntington City Mission. He says the work requirement has put a burden on food banks and soup kitchens in Cabell County, which, along with Berkeley, Harrison, Jefferson, Kanawha, Marion, Monongalia, Morgan, and Putnam counties, was part of a work requirement pilot program 
that aim to increase workforce participation. We had to go from three meals a day to two. And I say gut-wrenching because we knew that this meant that people would show up for food and we'd have to turn them away. We knew that some of them would go without food. We knew that some would say, well, those, those folks there at that mission, they said they'd always be there for us, and now they're not. And we knew that may have a more lasting effect on our spiritual mission. I'll tell you, there was no massive influx of population in July of 2016 in Huntington, no loss of a major employer. I believe in my heart that it was the implementation of the pilot program of this bill that nearly broke our back when all we were trying to do is to feed the hungry. Delegate Mike Pushkin pointed out the results of a March 2017 report from the State Department of Health and Human Resources showing that the nine-county pilot study on work requirements for SNAP benefits didn't show increased workforce participation. I would imagine the purpose of the bill is not to get people back to work because if that was, it, it doesn't do that. We have the information from the department that says it doesn't do that. It hasn't put anybody back to work. Um, it hasn't lowered unemployment. It hasn't increased workforce to, uh, participation in those nine counties. What it did do, and, and like the gentleman from the uh, uh, 17th pointed out, it has put a strain on uh, food banks in those counties. It has put a strain on uh, charitable organizations and churches in, in those nine counties. That's what it, what it did do. Delegate Larry Rowe argued that the bill will strip much needed food from those who need it most. He says forcing the poor to stay hungry will cause some to become angry and possibly more likely to commit crimes while just trying to survive. Now what this bill is going to do is to encourage hangriness and aggressiveness in the very population that we don't want to be aggressive or hangry. It's a terrible bill. It's a bill that is going to take food out of the mouths of people. And ladies and gentlemen, they're people. And if you're homeless or you're very poor, you don't have a car, you can't be driving off to some place to, to, to volunteer or to work. Exemptions to the work requirement include those who are disabled, pregnant, or giving care to a child, an incapacitated adult, or anyone over the age of 65. An amendment adopted by the House Judiciary Committee would also exempt veterans. Delegate Tom Fast, the lead sponsor of House Bill 4001, called the group who would fall under the work requirement as, quote, very narrow. Like other supporters, he says the bill aims to get people back to work and less dependent on assistance. We do not help a person by perpetuating dependence upon government. Again, if you would just look at the definition of able-bodied person and and what is excluded from that definition. These are the people who simply choose not to work. That creates dependency on government. It creates dependency on the food bank. People must be able to help themselves. That's the general rule. Delegate Michael Folk also spoke in favor of the bill. What's going on in this country and this state is systemic. This is not asking too much. And all this demagoguery we've heard here today, saying you're gonna take food out of babes' mouths, is just that. The gentleman over here from Fayette gave you example after example of all these people that testified, and it, the bill wouldn't apply. House Bill 4001 passed on a 78 to 19 vote, with many Democrats voting in favor. The bill now heads across the rotunda to the Senate. Joining us now is senior reporter Dave Mistich. Dave, thank you so much for being here tonight. No problem. There's obviously so much to talk about, so much going on today, but first let's update about the governor's pr press release that he sent out just right. now. Right. He, he sent out this, uh, this email via press release, uh, a message to educators, service personnel, other, other government workers, uh, basically talking about some of the troubles that the state was in whenever he took office uh, just over a year ago. Uh, he talked about the the darkest time in, in uh, being last year and how even at that point supported a 2% pay raise for teachers. Um, he called out uh, Christine Campbell of the American Federation of Teachers, West Virginia, and Dale Lee of the West Virginia Education Association, uh, saying that they praised his efforts a year ago and that now the tables have turned and that things are different. 
Um, so, you know, he, he goes on to sort of uh, also celebrate some of the things he's done within state education as far as appointments to the state board, uh, getting rid of a A through F uh, grading system for schools, um, and a, a whole slew of things here. This just came out just a few moments ago, but it's, it's uh, if you go through it and you read it, he's clearly, uh, and I know that he likes to talk about how he's not a politician and how party doesn't matter, um, but he does attack Democrats. Um, and you know it's it's all coming down to just two days before this teacher work stoppage on Thursday and Friday. So, so let's talk about some of the events that happened earlier today in the Senate. Now, the Senate passed the sports wagering bill today. Right, that's uh, Senate Bill 415. It was amended yesterday, um, so that a portion of of revenues from that uh, would go to the PEIA Stability Fund. I believe it's any excess of $15 million in revenue would go to that stability fund. And again, that bill passed today. We'll go ahead and take a look at some of the discussion on that bill from the Senate floor today. This could be very addicting. But if we're going to do that, we owe these people to bring as much of that money back to the state as we can. $5 million? $5 million the first year? I mean, I mean, think about what we're doing here, folks. We're getting ready to open up a, 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 a box that I'm not sure is going to have a lid on it. And it concerns me that we're going to tempt our citizens with something like this, and all we're going to get out of it is $5 million the first year. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. And with all due respect to my colleagues on this side of the aisle, I speak in favor of the bill. Um, I was at a Super Bowl party. And I would say a dozen of the people at that party were wagering on who's going to score the first points of the game, and they were doing it on their phone. And what the halftime score is going to be in third quarter. And, and these are all, you know, these are all sophisticated people that uh, make a wager freely and voluntarily on their phone. Um, they didn't have to go to a track. So this is going on, and this is a fact of modern society, and it's a stream of potential tax. So tell us a little bit about what happened there with that sports betting bill. Well, of course, what you saw just there was two Democrats that had two various different uh, views on, on that bill. The bill didn't inevitably pass, though, so um, even people in the same party didn't really agree. Um, whether or not to do it, so, but it inevitably it moves on to the House, so we'll see where it goes from there. Now, another bill that passed in the Senate today was the retirement bill. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Right, uh, and that's uh, Senate Bill 494, uh, and that basically uh, says that, uh, that professional teachers in the retirement system that go to work for a professional association are absent. Um, and uh, of course, there's a lot of conversations, and again, talking about you know Governor Justice's release there lately, there were some questions about this bill and whether or not that was an attack on Christine Campbell and Dale Lee specifically. We'll take a look at some of the some of the conversation on the Senate floor there earlier today. If in fact we el eliminate this, and teachers are not going to come down here to serve to represent their groups, who are you going to get? You're going to get those union bosses. I think this has the total effect of what you're trying to do. You know, uh, Dale Lee and Christine Campbell uh, are two fine teachers. They were selected to come down here because they understand the flight of teachers in the classroom. Who better to represent that constituent group than those people that, uh, you know, serve as teachers? I, I simply don't know what we're trying to do here. It, it seems like maybe there's a, a vengeance factor built into this. I'm not saying that there is. I, I hope there isn't. But I don't see any harm done to our retirement system. And simply passing this bill is, is certainly egregious. We're talking about people that are making $100,000 a year 
and their pension is going to be based on $100,000 a year, not based upon their typical teacher salary that might have been $50,000 a year. So there is a cost to be borne by teachers when these folks get this pension at the end that's based on their inflated income as a you know, officer of a statewide teaching association. It's not true to say that this is not some massive great benefit to them. And why for only two people in the entire state, we have almost two million people in this state, and somehow, somewhere back in the dark ages of history, these two positions were given this super special treatment where they can uh, get a pension that is far beyond anything they could ever get as a public school teacher, and for what? It's really hard to justify why they should get such a special deal. So one other thing that happened today is the PEIA Finance Board met to vote on their plan. Right, and of course there were some public meetings last week that led up to this. Uh, they are freezing the, the, the proposed changes to the plan that would increase premiums and deductibles. Um, of course, there was the House Bill 4620 that last week, I believe, that, uh, that deposited money to that program to freeze that. So uh, as long as that all makes it through, we, they, they should all be set for this year. So. And of course, the Rules Committee is set to meet today as well. Right. Uh, just a few moments ago, we heard uh, Senator President uh, Mitch Carmichael walking through the halls here. So uh, that was supposed to start at 4. It got pushed back to 4.30. And here we are later than that. And it's still not, you know, having happened yet. So. Well, Dave, thanks again for being here. Great. Thank you. And this concludes tonight's broadcast. Tomorrow we'll be joined by Energy Committee leadership as an oil and gas jobs rally is scheduled here at the Capitol. We'll also hear from the West Virginia Rivers Coalition about their concerns over the rapid increase in state oil and gas production. That's the legislature today, tomorrow at 6. I'm Andrea Lanham for West Virginia Public Broadcasting. Thanks for joining us and have a good night.